Thanks so much for being here, Josh Craddock. Absolutely. Good. Thanks for having me. Certainly. So pro-lifers have a lot to be hopeful for, especially those who are following along in the courts and who hope to one day see the unborn protected in law. One of the reasons that these pro-lifers are so optimistic is the appointment of Justice Amy Coney Barrett. So Josh is here with us today, and he's going to share a little bit about why are the pro-lifers so excited about Justice Barrett, and what could her legacy mean for the protection of the unborn in the law? Well, I think there's a lot of reasons to be excited about Justice Barrett's appointment to the Supreme Court. She's someone who has modeled uh, the pro-life ethic in her own life, having adopted children. And she's also uh, has a proven track record on the courts of appeals, voting on pro-life issues uh, in the cases that come before her. We've already actually seen that reaping dividends in a recent case that came out this month, unsigned opinion, but it was after the appointment of Justice Barrett that reinstated uh, a rule that the Health and Human Services had implemented that uh, prevented medication abortions uh, from being distributed without an in-person visit. So she's already changed the course of the Supreme Court on that issue. And I think that's especially a reason for hope uh, after the last term's uh, June medical decision. I think we'll really see a different track record and a different trajectory now that Justice Barrett is on the court. I completely agree. And I really hope that states are feeling emboldened seeing Justice Barrett on the court. You know, President Trump did appoint a third of the Supreme Court, Justice Barrett most recently. And I think states are starting to see that this really could be a favorable outcome as there are more justices now who don't rule based on their own policy preferences, but rule based on the law. And so what we're encouraging states to do is Family Research Council actually has a model bill banning abortion at the moment of conception. And so states really should feel empowered to start passing these and start really pressing on Roe and Casey. The states aren't the only ones. We're also seeing courts. The Eighth Circuit recently, although they struck down an Arkansas pro-life bill because they said they had to under Roe and Casey, they really pushed the Supreme Court saying, look, we ask you to revisit Roe and Casey. The viability standard isn't really working and it's very difficult for us to apply. And I think that's huge, a lower circuit court really asking the Supreme Court to relook at their precedent. We're seeing other lower courts upholding pro-life laws, such as bills that are passed to protect the unborn, who are specifically being targeted for abortion based on eugenic causes, based because they are diagnosed with Down syndrome or because of their gender or their race. So there's definitely a momentum building, and I think states and courts are really starting to see the benefits of having justices on the court that, again, are not legislating from the court, but are really looking to the meaning of the law, the meaning at the time it was enacted. Enacted. And speaking of laws and the meaning of it and the time it was enacted, I really wanted to turn to some of your research that is looking at the personhood of the unborn children under the 14th Amendment. For so long, conservatives had just accepted, you know, best case scenario, Roe's overturned, and it goes to the states. But your research actually might indicate that abortion is forbidden under the Constitution and the unborn are protected. So if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about your research on that. Absolutely. Well, as you point out, even pro-abortion legal scholars have criticized the Roe and Casey decisions as a massive overreach and not something that's in the Constitution at all. But when you actually look at the original meaning of the 14th Amendment, which guarantees that no state shall deprive any person of due process of law or the equal protection of the laws, you actually find that far from protecting abortion in the liberty provision of the 14th Amendment, it actually prohibits abortion abortion because the original meaning of the term person included all human beings born or unborn. And so my argument in the Harvard Journal of Public Law and Public Policy uh, actually examined that original meaning. First, uh, looking at the text, looking at dictionaries of common and legal usage at the time that the 14th Amendment was adopted and how they defined person or human being interchangeably. Second, I looked at the centuries of common law precedent and state practice that the states inherited from their colonial days all the way up into the 1800s when fer the fertilization standard uh, was really developed and codified in both judicial rulings and in state laws. And finally, I looked at the authors of the 14th Amendment, what they had to say and what their original expected application of the text was. Uh, so when they were adopting this amendment, what did they think it was going to do? And insofar as that's indicative of the original meaning of the text, 
uh, it actually shows that they expected it to protect all persons, no matter their condition, age, uh, anything. It was designed to prevent anything like what happened with uh, slavery and Dred Scott from ever happening again. So I want to go in a little bit more what you said the founders and vision of this, the framers and vision of this was because, you know, Roe and Casey says a state cannot outlaw abortion before viability. We have people sh shouting your abortion, saying that, you know, even the most minor of requirements such that the local abortion clinics follow the same standards as hospitals, that's being struck down and that's being challenged constantly saying, no, Roe is or abortion is a constitutional right. So is, is this really what the framers of the 14th Amendment ever envisioned their amendment to include, one that was built to protect people? Yeah, absolutely. They they intended this and designed this amendment to be a radically inclusive amendment. And it just boggles the mind that it was interpreted to exclude a subset of individuals who are considered human beings at the time that the amendment was written. So the primary framer of the 14th Amendment, Representative John Bingham, believed that the amendment prevented states from refusing, quote, any of the rights which pertain to common humanity. Senator Jacob Howard, who sponsored the amendment in the Senate, emphasized that the amendment guaranteed even the lowest and most despised members of the human race the equal protection of the laws. And during congressional debates, one representative, James Brown, asked rhetorically, does the term person carry with it anything further than a simple allusion to the existence of the individual? So it was clear that for the framers of the 14th Amendment, if a human life could be shown to exist, personhood and constitutional personhood, uh, those guarantees and protections would be triggered. And that is so powerful. With uh, the President Trump appointing a third of the Supreme Court, a third of the lower courts of appeals, which are the courts just below the Supreme Court, all in all over 200 judges with a lot of those who are proudly proud to say that they are originalists, that look at the original meaning of the text at the, at the time of enactment. We're really looking forward to seeing the future of pro-life legal litigation moving forward and hoping for the day that the unborn are protected in law. So thanks so much for being here, Josh. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you.